Well, amen. Thank you, band. Appreciate it. Well, guys, good to have you here. Uh, we started a new series today entitled The Carpenter's Toolbox, and uh, uh, the, the idea of it came, uh, Justin was preaching for me a few weeks back, and, and uh, I began to think about God's tools and all that God wanted to use in our lives, and every time I've preached on God's tools, I've always talked about spiritual gifts and the Holy Spirit of God working inside of our life, and, and uh, I began to realize that as I looked at what's happening around us, I don't know if you realize this or not, but, uh, but there's some very fatal things uh, that, are going, that, that are being exposed in our culture uh, during this time. Uh, I, uh, I, was just, I was just blown away that, that now we're talking about bailing out uh, states and, and uh, fixing to uh, pass, trying to pass a bill for $3 trillion. If you stack $100 bills on top of each other, not end to end, but on top of each other, the stack will go to the moon, wrap around the moon, and come back to the earth. That's how much $3 trillion is. I mean, think about that. The, 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 the problem is not that this has happened. The problem is that this is exposed. Problems are already there. Problems are already in our families. You know, I was, uh, I was uh, watching this lady on Facebook, and she was giving a, bit, uh, a, a fake news conference, you know, because of the COVID virus, you're supposed to stay at home unless you need to leave the home. And if you do need the home, you need to wear a mask because the mask might help you, but then the mask might not help you. So you really don't have to wear a mask unless you really want to wear a mask, unless you have to go to work. If, uh, if, you, uh, if you have children, you need to keep your children home because they can't go to school unless you have to go to work and then you can find a place to put them in school. But if you don't, uh, if you can't do that, drinking can start at 10 o'clock because you have children at home and you're not used to of being a parent, and I'm going, why should somebody with a kid go, wow, I have to start teaching my kid? And I started thinking that, that there's so many things that, that are going on around us that, that we should have been doing all, of, all along. Jesus teaches us that we should be p- preparing for things, that, that as a follower of God, we, we shouldn't have to have to get extra money from somewhere because we've been putting back and, and what it's really exposed. And I'm going, wow, we've missed the boat somewhere. So I thought, well, you know, I'd, I'd put together this sermon series on God's toolbox. Here's some things that you need to know from God's Word to live life over and above all the other things that are going on in the world. And I, man, I'm putting it together, I'm asking this and I'm so excited, and I get called to go to a funeral in Louisiana. And... Uh, uh, Shelly and I head down to Louisiana, and, and we've got our mask in the center compartment, you know, and I'm thinking, what am, what, you know, what, what, you know, I'm going to drive down eight hours, do the funeral, and then drive back, and, and uh, called a friend of mine, and I haven't seen in, in several years, and said, you know, to be honest with you, I'm coming here to do this funeral, but I, I want to sit down and talk to you. He said, well, well KT... Uh, you know, since this started, nobody goes in the house, but as usual, I'm going to be sitting on my front porch, uh, drinking my coffee, reading my Bible in the morning. If you want to stop by, I'd love to see you. So uh, I got the privilege of sitting down and, and talking with him, and, uh, you know, we talked about old times. And we got finished, and I was so excited to, to see him, and then I did the funeral, and we're headed out of town, and I, I get a text from my friend, and here I am driving down the interstate just crying like a baby because of the text that he sent me. And then I began to think about all the things that he and I talked about during our three hours. Uh, we didn't talk about the fact that the, the Boss 302 Mustang Laguna Seca that I had that was number 622 out of 640 total made that would go 115 miles an hour. We didn't talk about that car. We didn't talk about the Corvettes that he had had. We didn't talk about the house he has that's paid off and the fact that he's now retired. You know, we talked about... We spent three hours talking about how during those times our kids were growing up and they were struggling in things and we just 
cried together and prayed out to God. I, I talked about those times that, that somebody either wanted to kill me or fire me. And my friend stood in front of him and said, before you get to him, you've got to get to me first. We talked about our grandchildren and the dreams that we have for them. We, we, we talked about some of the social change that, that God allowed us to bring out. Don't you worry about it at all. She's saying amen to granddaddy. Okay? <laughs> That's my granddaughter over there, and it's fine. Y'all leave her alone. And if your grandkids start running around yapping, I'm not going to say a word. I'm just glad you're here. And, and I begin to realize that on, that on that long drive back that I probably, not probably, that I had left off the most important tool in God's toolbox. Yours might not look like this. Maybe yours is on the phone, or maybe you just depend on the screen, but just a minute, we're fixing to open this thing up, and I'm going to show you something amazing. Because the most important tool in Jesus' life that he got from God was the tool of setting priorities. You see, when you and I set the proper priorities, those priorities filter the information that we allow in our mind. They, they, the, the priorities determine who I'm going to listen to and who I'm not. What I'm going to read and fill my mind with and what I'm going to go, you know, this is garbage. In American history, there has never been a more stark contrast in what you and I are told. I grew up as a little kid having to watch Walter Cronkite every night. And, and I remember Walter Cronkite with that profound, deep voice. That's the news. You and I are often not told really what's happening. Most of the time on TV, even in non-news, you and I are simply with a fire hydrant. It has expressed to us how you should think, not what's really happening and it covers from one end of the gamut to the other. Our priorities determine, determine how we filter information. Our, our priorities determine our direction. Am I going to go left? Am I going to go right? Am I going to go straight? Am I going to turn around and go the other way? Our, 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 our priorities determine that. They define our direction. They focus our attention. I'm sitting down at the Mavericks game at the finals on the front row watching the Mavericks in the NBA Finals. And there's a timeout. And the Mavericks dancers run out. I'm talking right in front of me. The guy beside me goes, wow. And my wife goes, what are you doing? And I went, I'm not looking at this. I didn't realize it, but another pastor in the air is sitting in the nosebleed with some binoculars. He actually wrote me a note the next week and said, Carl, I noticed that you were sitting on the front row with Troy Aikman sitting beside you and George Clooney sitting beside your wife. Yeah. Didn't help it that my wife said he was easy to look at. But anyway, he, nice guy. Both of them are. And in the note, he simply said, you never took your eyes off the game, but I noticed you never turned your head back until the bikini models had gone off the floor.
Our priorities focus where we put our attention. Our, our priorities organize our task. If, if anything, this has shown us that, that at times we waste too much time doing stuff that really doesn't make a difference. Our priorities direct our actions. I was reading the other day, I, uh, I love war stories and I love reading people's history. I was reading, was reading the history of, of William Hawkins. William Hawkins was a Marine in, in, 19, in the 1940s and he led a, a group of 40 men uh, in the Battle of Tarawa in 1943. Uh, he, uh, he was on, on uh, Betio, B-E-T-I-O, Betio Island. And uh, he was injured by shrapnel as they stormed the beach and continued on with his guys. He didn't want to leave them. And a couple hours into the fight, he and his 40 men were pinned down by a group of metal pyramid heavy machine gun emplacements by the Japanese. None of his guys could move. They, they were pinned down and they were stuck. And so, so what William did is William crawled on his belly with his M1 and got to the first pillbox and, and stuck his M1 in the pillbox and killed the Japanese that were in it. Okay? So he crossed to the next one. He crossed to the next one. At that moment, he runs out of, out of, out of bullets for his M1. He goes back and he gets grenades and bag bombs and he strapped these bags and he, he goes to pillbox number three and then number four then number five, then number six. At pillbox number seven, he gets shot. He's actually got a sucking chest wound. He's shot this side, goes right inside the edge of his lungs, cracks a couple of ribs. He crawls back behind the lines. The medic is there, and they're bandaging him up, and they're putting the stuff on him. They wrap him up, and the captain comes up to him and says, William, You've, you've done your job. It's time for you to head back stateside. What do you think William said? I'm going to read it. He yelled at his captain, I'm not doing it, sir. I came here to, here to kill Japs and not go home. He gets another bag of grenades, crawls back to the eighth pyramid emplacement. And as he reaches up and throws the bag, he's shot again. A few of his friends from his platoon crawl out, grab him, drag him back. And as he's laying on a stretcher now for the third time, he said this, boys, I sure hate to leave you like this. And he died. What causes a young man to single-handedly storm a dozen machine gun emplacements by himself? After getting hit with shrapnel on the beach, Okay, guys, I'm out of here. I'm hurting. After getting shot in the chest and his captain telling him, we're sending you back home. No, I didn't come here to go home. I'm going back. Only to be fatally shot again and, and, and look at his buddies and with regret, regret say, guys, I'm sorry I wasn't able to finish the task. He risked his life with obvious reasons to be able to withdraw, dying, regretting he couldn't do more. Why? If you've ever been a Marine, I haven't. But you talk to a Marine and they'll tell you that the Marine Corps is drilling them from day one, every day, all day long. God, 
poor country. See, William understood that what was most important about his life was not that he would extend it, but that he would defend his country. But more importantly than that, that he would protect his troops. But more importantly than that even so is that he was here because this was God's calling in his life. You see, whether you're William Hawkins or, or my friend who's getting on up there in age, sitting on his porch, the things that you and I do that are significant, the things that you and I do that are important, the things that you and I do that give a lifetime and an eternity of memories without regret are making sure our lives are defined by the right priority. In God's toolbox, what you're going to find is that Jesus not only lived according to a set of priorities, but he taught them. For example, in the book of John, chapter 4, verse 4, the Todd disciples had asked him, Jesus, why are you doing this? And Jesus simply said, my food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Jesus said, that which sustained me is to be and do what God called me to accomplish. He's defining priority. In Luke 19, 10, Jesus said, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. He's looking at the disciples and says, guys, one of God's priorities in my life is to go out and find people that don't know God and introduce them. Priorities. Before we started putting things on Facebook, I, uh, God allowed me to lead a man to Christ, and he didn't want to be baptized in the baptistry here, he just had to do it out in the lake. Shelly and I, Shelly found that old video the other day, and it's been years ago. I didn't need the video to remember what happened or what it looked like. I didn't need the video to remind me that before I baptized him, he told people there at the lake how Jesus had changed and saved his life. And one of his friends walks out into the lake and says, can I get baptized and accept Jesus too? Yeah, come on. It is burned in my mind. Why? Because significant events are not what we have, but the difference that we make. And Jesus said, God has placed it in me and my desires to seek and save that which is lost. In the book of Matthew, chapter 26, verse 39, going a little further, he fell on his face on the ground and said, Father, if it is possible, may this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus <clears throat> before he's going to go to the cross, before he's going to go to trial, is praying and he says, Dad, is there some other way we can accomplish the salvation of mankind? But if not, Dad, if what you want me to do is die for them, it's not what I want, Dad, it's what you want. What is he doing? Jesus is saying that my life is to find by the priority of following God. The book of John, chapter 19, verse 30. As Jesus was on the cross before he died, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. To the very last moment of his life, as he's on the cross, suffocating to death, as the blood is flowing out of his body, as he struggled reading, as he struggled even speaking, he yelled at, Dad, I did what you sent me here to do. Jesus lived his life according to priorities. You see, without the correct priority set, our life, our, our entire life direction is altered. 
I, I know many people say, well, Carl, I don't have priorities. Yes, you do. Everybody has priorities. They, not, might, might, they might not be written down, but you've got them. The question is not whether or not we have them. The question is whether or not we're living by them. The question is not whether or not they're good or, 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 or bad. The question is whether they're defined by God. I, I had a, a bad problem. I was conceived as a, as a male child. Um, I have a chromosome that females don't have, which means for most of my life I've had a particular problem. It's with most men. The problem that we have is that we want to fix things. Let me finish. That's just, there's a, there's a comma there. We want to fix things, but usually we don't want someone to tell us how to do it or read the instructions. A number of years ago, an uncle of my, my grandson, my oldest grandson, gave, gave his uh, mom and dad to give him for Christmas this green riding pedal car. I mean, it's a neat racing green pedal car, and it is so cool, it's just... It's just awesome. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And, and they lived in our home for, for five years. And uh, they moved out. And, um, and I love them to death. But wow, it's nice, just mom and I. You know, and, and uh, sorry, I, I got lost in thought. It's another male problem when you think about your wife. So, so anyway, we're, 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 we're sitting here, and I'm looking at this green box that's been sitting in my house for like, three, four years, and Damon's coming to the house, and I'm going, you know, shall, I'm going to put this thing together so that Damon can play with it. Yeah, it's about time. He got it when he was two, and it's for four to seven years old, and now he's six. I'm going to put this thing together, okay? So I put it together, and I got out my tool set, my little box, and, you know, my portable one, you know, and... Uh, you know, I put it all together, and boy, it's looking good. And Damon got there, and he goes, wow. And I said, man, Damon, that is yours. You're going to get to play with it today. And I carried it outside and put it on the sidewalk, and, and uh, he's just driving to town about 10 feet, and then it goes off the road and, and starts going to the treat. And I said, no, Damon, turn it. He said, it won't turn. This, this wheel fell off. And Shelly just looked at me. She said, you do remember when I asked you what was that extra bolt for? I mean, the steering wheel snapped in place. You know, there's a, a, a rod that goes out of the bottom of it that catch, connects to the steering mechanism. You just push it up in there and you pop that thing in place, put the cap on it, and you're driving to town, right? Wrong. All I would have had to have done is look at the last step on the instructions. It said, take this 3 8 washer and nut and bolt on the steering wheel and place cover. But I got it done. You see, Without the correct set of priorities, we're always going to filter the wrong information. We're going to make things a great deal more important than other things. Without the right priorities, we're going to turn most often in the wrong direction. Without the right priorities, we're going to focus our attention on inconsequential issues. We're, we're going to argue about stupid stuff that don't matter. We're going to organize tasks that distract instead of accomplish things. It's going to direct our actions to destroy and not to build up. You see, God has given us this toolbox to teach us how to function in life. And, and we read it to get saved. We read it to tell people why we're Baptist. 
but God gave it to us to say, this is the user's manual for my life. In the toolbox in Matthew chapter 16, verse 33. After Jesus had talked about all of these things that everybody chases after, Jesus said this. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. All these things, money, houses, jobs, food, clothes. You see, we, we set so many things up as priorities that, that simply are temporary. We, we blow money on stuff that just, it just it, it doesn't make sense. Why? It's just temporary. I, I, I know people that have closets and closets of clothes, all the latest fashions of this year and then a section of last year and the year before and the year before. I actually know, I actually know an older man that's got leisure suits in his closet because... They just might come back. You know, there's just some things that I just wish would go away and stay away. Think about all the things you and I worry about. Guys, I want to tell you, when you're in your 70, you're 78, 80, 85, you're 90 years old, you're not going to be sitting there going, wow, I had a car that was hot and would go fast one time. You're, you're, you're not going to be talking about a Mont Blanc pen that you used to have. That's why Jesus tried to get in the middle of people's lives and say, listen folks, you need to understand the first tool in all of life is seek first the kingdom of God. If, if this is what I will focus on first, then all this stuff will be okay. If, if this is what I will look to, following God and doing God's will, then all of this other stuff will pan out. So Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and, and his righteousness. I want to share with you a second priority you and I need to have, not just seeking first the kingdom of God, but priority number two. John chapter 15, verses 5 through 7. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, help me out, bears much fruit. I just want to stop there just for a moment. What does abide in? It means to connect, to focus on, to spend time with. The very beginning in the Garden of Eden, God walked with Adam and Eve every day and he talked with them and he spent time with them. They understood his heart. He understood their desires to abide. It means to intimately know. If you will come to where you intimately know me, I will come and I will intimately know you. Why is that so important? David said it this way. David said, delight yourself in the Lord. Abide in him. And he will give you the desires of your heart. God wants the very best for you. But for him to do that, you've got to abide with him. So Jesus said, guys, you listen, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Now help me out. For, for without 
me. You can do nothing. You think maybe that kind of makes it a priority? Jesus is saying, men, ladies, you've got to understand this. If you will make a priority abiding with me, I will bless you and you will have everything you need. But if you don't, you'll have nothing. You say, well, all right, stop, Carl. I can prove this Bible verse is wrong because there are mega wealthy people who don't even believe in God. You actually think for a moment that money's going to make you happy? There are just as many people that are rich, percentage-wise, that kill themselves as people that are not rich. Matter of fact, there's less suicide amongst the lower-income community as opposed to the higher-income community. You can spend all your money buying all the junk you want. I've got a friend that's got an eBay business, and, uh, and you know what he calls it? He calls it idiot stuff. He provides for his family selling idiot stuff. And I looked at some of the, the, the junk he sells, and I'm going, you know what, you're right. You know what this guy does? He goes into to, to use clothing st in stores, okay? Places like that. And he, he's got an agreement with several of the managers, and before they put stuff out on the shelf, he goes in the back room and goes through the boxes. And he buys blue jeans and uh, purses that have fancy labels on them and fancy wallets. Okay? I want you to think about this, okay? He buys used blue jeans and purses and wallets. Now, how do those stores get them? People buy them, pay a lot of money for them, and use them, and what happens? They get tired of them because that's last year's stuff. Or, you know, I've used this for so long. I mean, it's not that they don't work anymore, but just it's not the thing anymore. So somebody's come out in a new magazine and says there's something new, and what you have is not good anymore, so they go out and buy something else, so they basically stick the rest of it in thrash, trash bags, throw it in a dumpster, somebody has paid minimum wage to get it out of the dumpster, dump it on a table, and he goes through it and he goes, wow, some idiot will buy this. And he puts it on eBay. The other day I said, man, how's your day going? He said, man, I sold this purse for $420. I said, man, what kind of purse? And I don't even remember the name on it. I said, who in the world would pay over $400 for a used purse? Come on, help me out. An idiot. You say, well, Carl, you can't say that. It's not that they tried it out that it would be functional. It's not because it's functional. It's not because it's good quality leather. It has nothing to do with that. It simply has to do with the fact that there's a nameplate on it that somebody at some time thought was great and they can't afford the newest thing, so I'll have last year's and I'm going to have one. And I'm going... Guys, I'm not preaching against stuff. I, 
I'm not trying to say that wearing some blue jeans with some label on it is a good thing or a bad thing. I'm not saying that at all. I, there's stuff that I have that I don't use. I'm trying to get rid of a lot of it, but I just... When did this, the things that we have become anything more than just a tool? If there is anything in our life that we're chasing at the expense of time with our family, the ability to provide for our children, our spouse, and even our grandchildren, then tools have been turned into priorities. So Jesus gets in the middle of a world that's gone haywire. He said, you want to make a difference? You want to have a life that at the end of it, you're going to go, wow, this has been amazing. Live your life by a defined set of priorities that starts with, number one, seek God and His kingdom above everything else. Number two, to daily abide with God. You know what's going to happen? If you'll do that, everything else in life will be defined by it. Seek God first. Abide with God. You know what kind of husband you're going to be if you abide with God? You're going to get over where Paul said, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave his life for. You're going to spend your life dying for your wife. My wife is more important in my life than I am. You know what that's going to do? Your sons are going to start looking for a girl saying, you know what, I want to marry a woman that I can love the way my daddy loves my mama. Your daughters are going to look at some of these guys that are going to chase them simply because they've got a shapely derriere. I'm trying to say this politely. And she's going to look at them and go, <laughs> no. Nah. You're not even close to my daddy. You see, life prioritized by seeking God's kingdom and abiding in God is going to flesh out into everything else. Richard and I did talk about something. We exchanged pictures. We, we drove over there in my, my, wife's, my, wife's, my wife's flashy flashy truck, and he had never seen it. My wife drives a Hummer. Now, we bought it used, and I blew up the first engine in it. Now we've got another engine in it, and, and uh, we're getting close to 300,000 miles on it. And Shelly loves it because she knows I love driving a Jeep, and the Hummer's comfortable and quiet and has air conditioning. So anyway, that, that's kind of our compromise. And, uh, and uh, we drove up in the yard, and my friend said, only Carl would drive something like that. When I was there, I drove a, a souped-up V8 uh, convertible Camaro. Uh, I had to sell it because there was a kid who wanted one just like it. He got a V6, the same color and everything. It wasn't like mine. It wasn't an SS. It was the cheap, you know, six-cylinder junk. And... Uh, the problem is that he finally got him a girl. I guess that's why a guy drives a hot car anyway, and he got him a girl. And they'd go around town with the top down, and he was about five foot 11 in black hair, and he would drive around town with his arm around this blonde-headed girl. And uh, anyway, everybody thought it was me. So I sold the car so I could get people's tongues to quit wagging. And, and uh, Richard, he said, you know, I knew you'd be driving something like that. And I said, really, it's mine. 
He said, well, Carl, what are you driving these days? And Shelly pulled up a picture of my old green pickup truck. And Richard just laughed. He said, Carl, you want to see what I drive? Yeah. He pulled up a picture of a 1994 single cab, non-four-wheel drive Chevrolet. He had bought it for his son when he graduated college, and his son decided after four years that it was time to trade it in because he had gotten all of his value out of it. He said, Carl, you know, it's amazing what you can do with a pickup truck if you just change the oil and grease it and add gas and do maintenance to it. Man could have anything he wants. Drive up to any dealership. They all know who he is. They won't even tell him to write a check. They just say, we'll send the, we'll send the bill to your house. As I'm leaving town, I'm reading his note. He didn't have to say what he did. You see, Richard has a spiritual gift of being a Barnabas. He knew that it had been a long day. KT, I just wanted to send you a note. I knew what he was doing. Like he has for the past 25 years, he just wanted to send me a note to encourage me. I'm 57 years old. I realize a lot of you got you're more experienced than I do. Hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people have passed through my life. But the people that have made a difference in my life are not because of all the flashy stuff they've got. but because of the spiritual, personal investment that they've made in my life. Now I want to ask you a question. The way you spend your time and your money and your talents define what your priorities are. You spend this week looking at how have I lived my life? How have I invested the resources I've been given? And you know what it'll do? It will define for you what your priorities are. I've known a lot of people in their 70s and 80s. I've known a lot that have been sad and just looked back and wondered where did all the time go. But I've seen a few that have come to the end of their life like William Dawkins. And the only sadness they have is the regret that they couldn't have done more. The first tool in the carpenter's toolbox, live a life designed, directed, and challenged by priorities. Priority one, seek first the kingdom of God. Priority two, Abide in me and I in you. And Jesus said, and I promise you, you will bear much fruit. Let me pray with you.
Father God, thank you for your love and your grace. Thank you, Father, for an amazing day to serve you. Lord, there are so many people in my life that have made such radical differences that, that I'll never get over it. Father, thank you. Father, I pray for each person that's in this room and Father, the people that are going to be watching on Facebook and YouTube that can't be here. Father, I pray that you would bless them and encourage them. Father, as we, we continue on in this series about the toolbox, God, I, I pray that we will be anxious to get inside. And okay, how is the best way to live my life? Lord, that's what your toolbox, the Bible, is all about. Father, I thank you that when we seek first the kingdom of God, all this other stuff will be added. Father, I pray that I would never be the person chasing the latest fad. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Growing up as a kid, my mother had a dog, it's a Chihuahua. Now I know that some of y'all have those nasty little critters, and I don't know your dogs, well I know a few of them, but my mother's Chihuahua just yeah, 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 and nipped, every time I'd go through the room, that dog would sneak up behind me and nip me on the back of the heel. One of the worst whippings I ever got with my mother's hairbrush is when I turned around and kicked that dog back. By the way, if you're a kid watching this, don't kick your mama's dog. <laughs> but that chihuahua had two games, nipping at my brother and I and barking at us as number one. And number two was that dog loved to chase her tail. Just loved it. I mean, loved it. That dog would get in a circle and she'd turn her head around and she'd try to squeeze her body together and you know, her tail, you know, those little wiry tails kind of stick out. She'd swing that tail around and she just chased her tail all the way around us. Just chase, 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 chased her tail. I decided to help her one day. <laughs> and I reached down and grabbed her tail in her head and I put the two together. <laughs> Not bad, I'm, don't, don't call out the SPCA and the NPCUDIP and all that kind of stuff. I wasn't wanting to hurt the dog. I wanted to help the dog catch its tail. For years, the dog chased its tail. Have you ever seen that? You know what happened when I helped her chase her tail and she bit that thing? Ah, she, she, in dog bark, she yelled and screamed, that hurt. I'm positive that's what she would, ah, 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 ah. When she finally caught her tail, she realized that hurt. You know what she was doing the next day? Chasing her tail. You know why I think that so many people really have mental problems? When you spend all your time and effort changing, chasing fads and the newest, latest thing, and you get it, it tastes good for a moment, doesn't it? Then it starts turning sour, and it doesn't make you happy anymore, and you just, you do what? Come on, help me out, come on, help me out. You move from that one on to the next one. Most people in America are like dogs. They spend their life chasing their tail. They catch it every once in a while, and then they realize that, you know, this isn't tasty anymore, and they start chasing their tail again. Make your priority, seeking first the kingdom. 
abiding with God. And you will find that being in the presence of God is a sweet-smelling taste that you never get over and you want it every single day. Have a great week. I love you. Stay safe.